Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. A very warm welcome on this incredibly cold and snowy afternoon. And a heartfelt thank you to all of you for struggling through this weather to make it here today. I promise you it will be worth your while. My name is Ulrika al -Khamis. I'm the director for collections and public programs here at the uh, Khan Museum. And let me, uh, let me say that before I introduce our wonderful speaker this afternoon, and we contemplate how land, culture, and architecture influence each other, I would like to acknowledge that the land on which the Arachan Museum stands today has been a cultural meeting place for hundreds of years under the stewardship of the indigenous peoples of Turtle Island, including the Huron Wendat, the Petun First Nations, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. We honor them and we express our sincere gratitude. It is my sincere pleasure and honor today, in partnership with the Design TO Festival, to introduce Marina Tabassum, an outstanding and deeply inspiring architect, teacher, woman, and international beacon for the cultural creativity of her country, Bangladesh. Born in Dhaka in 1971, Marina graduated from the Bangladesh University of Engineering and Technology in 1995. And in the same year, she co-founded Urbana, an architectural practice that then went on to design the Independence Monument of Bangladesh and also its Museum of Independence. In 2005, Marina founded Marina Tabassum Architects, now known as MTI, with the declared vision of grounding her work above all else in empathetic considerations of local history and culture, materials and climate. It is this approach, and of course not to mention the outstanding technical and aesthetic qualities of her work, that recently earned her both the 2016 Arachan Award for Architecture and the 2018 Jamil Prize for her Beit Ruf Mosque in Dhaka, for which, incidentally, she also acted as a client, a fundraiser, and a builder. Before I invite Marina to the stage, I would like to introduce Brigitte Shim, who is a member of the steering committee of the Arachan Award for Architecture, as well as a member of the master jury and a reviewer for the um, a field reviewer, who also would like to say a few words about Marina and her work. And then, please, if you introduce the speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, I'll be very brief. Uh, my name is Bridget Shim, so I'm a practicing architect in Toronto and also a professor at the John H. Daniels Faculty of Architecture, Landscape and Design at the University of Toronto. Uh, <clears throat> in a way, um, it's so wonderful and so important that Marina is here to speak to us today. And in a way, to, especially to be in this museum. This is the Aga Khan Museum. And in a way, for the last over 40 years, there has been this very special award, uh, the Aga Khan Architecture Award. <clears throat> and it really uh, addresses a whole range of questions and issues that I think the, the rest of the world is just catching up to. Uh, it's really a kind of expanded definition of what architecture is. And it's so inspiring, and the results and the award-winning projects really provide um, really wonderful models for us to think about in terms of the future of our built world. So really, I would say what's important about the lecture that you'll, you're about to hear is that Marina really uh, um, is a kind of beacon of having us understand what the award is all about. Hers is one of many projects that have received this award. But in a way, I learned so much from every one of the winning projects because they really expand our definition of what architecture and the built form is capable of doing. <clears throat> so as, uh, as was said, the kind of 
Normally we think of architects in North America as drawing things and kind of uh, working away to kind of <clears throat> be part of a building process. But in a way through Marina's project, I think what you'll understand is that architects can be community builders, architects can be placemakers, architects can be social entrepreneurs, and architects can be enablers to really transform their communities. Um, I think that one of the important things about the way that Marina describes her work is that she talks about the place that she lives and works and that the kind of visceral understanding of the land and the starting point for anything that you build is really listening first and knowing about the place that you're building in is a kind of critical dimension of architecture that matters and architecture that lasts. Um, I think that we're really lucky to have her here. Um, I think coming in the middle of winter um, and uh, in this uh, snowy climate, and I feel very privileged and honored to, to be part of, to allow Marina to have her voice and to share her work with us. So I would like to introduce Marina uh, to join us on the stage and to present her projects to us. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for coming. I mean, I can't imagine uh, driving through this cold <laughs> winter. This is for me the first time experiencing minus 12. <laughs> I've never done this before. I thought I would die. You know? <laughs> yeah, it's, um, you know, I'm a completely tropical creature, so. Um, and if, for the first time, I have learned to sort of bundling up with all this. Feels like I'm going to a war. <laughs> and I'm constantly losing things, like I lost my gloves, so Bridget has been nice enough to supply me with gloves constantly. <laughs> so, so yeah, it's nice to be here, and thank you so much for, um, for being here today. Um, you know, my practice is based in Bangladesh, so it's a completely different landscape than Toronto or even Canada. Um, it's a tropical landscape, so probably in this cold winter I will be able to take you a little bit to a warmer place. <laughs> so, um, architecture for me is a sort of a manifestation or, let's say, a response of a place, and um, that place is, is actually the geographical location, and it, it's something that gives us our uniqueness, who we are as people. So the climate, the culture, uh, these things are important uh, in terms of architecture for me. And the other thing that actually drives this whole uniqueness of us and the culture that we embody is time. And time is basically constantly shaping and reshaping this um, experience. And so context to me is something which is a it's kind of a matrix of these two time and place metrics. So it, it's always, for me, it's always whenever I give a talk, I like to give a, a little uh, introduction or take you to a journey through the space or the place where I come from. So this is Bangladesh. Um, it is very green. Uh, it's in the foothills of the Himalayas. And there are two rivers, um, major rivers, which is the Brahmaputra and the Ganges. And these two rivers are born in the Himalayan mountains and then flowing through to the Bay of Bengal. And while doing so, created this land, which is actually the delta of uh, uh, you know, the, the Ganges delta. So Bangladesh, two thirds of the land is actually delta. And if you look very closely, you'll see that it's absolutely crisscrossed by these numerous rivers, uh, tributaries, uh, which is more than 700 in number. And they basically create this entire landscape. And the land is absolutely fluid. There is no distinction between water and land. It's a, it's a complete, you know, it's, it's, it's all together. So it's a very fluid landscape. It's a very... Um, it's a landscape where when the rivers change their course, it erodes, and then again it emerges in some places. So quite often, um, people leave their land because it just goes in under the water, 
And then that land emerges somewhere else, and so they go and inhabit that land. So there's a very dynamic relationship to land and a very intense adaptation that generally takes place. But at the same time, um, we have these two different seasons. One season we have monsoon, which rains, it pours really. And then uh, during that time, the lands go underwater, so it becomes very, uh, I wouldn't call it flood, but it's water's right to be there. So that's how we treat it. You cannot call that flood. It's it's actually water's right. So during that time, people generally go fishing. And again, during the summer, uh, during the dry season, which is our winter, very moderate temperature, you would laugh if I say it winter. Um, so basically, that time, it becomes a farmland. So that's how people try to negotiate with the land that exists, with the climate. And um, so it's a very fertile alluvial ground. We get three crops a year, uh, which makes it a very rich landscape. And having more than 700 rivers, it's also a place where we have fishing quite a bit. And we have a huge population. We have about 150 million people uh, in a land area about 148,000 square kilometers, probably the size of Ontario. Okay, so, so yeah, so that's, um, and that is actually, there's a lot of impermanence into the landscape, as I mentioned, that there is so much of fluidity in the landscape. So people try to adapt, people try to negotiate, and try to live with the minimum of uh, possibilities. So optimizing is also very important. This image I always find very fascinating. It's, uh, what you see green is actually, uh, not green, it is actually a river. And when there is no movement in the water, especially in the deltas, uh, quite often you see these water hyacinth plants growing all over. And it basically clogs the entire uh, waterways. So you cannot take your boat from one side to the other side. So what happens quite often when there is no bridge or anything, people create these boat bridges and so they bring all the boats together and creating a boat bridge and then, you know, charges people, like maybe one taka, two taka, to just cross the river. So that's how people negotiate. And I think that's really beautiful, how you can live with nature. And optimizing, as I mentioned, having the minimum of means to live their lives, living very naturally and symbiotically with nature. That's also something very unique. You can hardly find these things anymore. Uh, in terms of climate, we, have, we are in the Tropic of Cancer, so it makes us a subtropical climate. If I show you here, that's Bangladesh, and the Tropic of Cancer is going through. So it's a sub, which means that we have a dry season uh, when we have uh, the wind coming from the north, which is over the Himalayan mountain range, so it's very dry. And uh, we have a monsoon, which during that time, w the wind is actually flowing from the uh, southern side, so from the Bay of Bengal, bringing in a lot of moisture. So summer uh, with rain is something very um, festive. We enjoy it. We, uh, rain is something we celebrate. But the, during the dry season, it's a generally a very dusty landscape because of the very fine dust with which the entire land is made of. So the temperature generally remains very moderate throughout the year. So basically, if you talk about architecture, it's only you need four columns and a roof to cover yourself from the elements. And that's what architecture requires to live in a land like that. There is no glass, no insulation, <laughs> nothing of that sort that you have to struggle here with. Architecture for us is all about celebrating nature and to be one with nature. So basically a plinth to keep you above the water level, columns and a roof, and to let the air flow. So that's what we've been trying to achieve throughout. And you'll find long verandas, especially in the earlier days. We used to see these buildings where they have these long verandas, which actually acts like a buffer between the outside and inside. But these verandas, if I remember from my childhood, are the spaces which we inhabited. And this is the space where we lived our lives. 
not in the rooms, but in the verandas. So that's something quite unique. And of course, as I mentioned, that it needs to be very porous. It's porous, uh, porosity is something very much uh, also there in terms of architectural language. So these are the elements that I try to also address in my architecture. This is uh, not my project, I wish it was. This is by Mazarul Islam, uh, the first architect of Bangladesh. And this is a building from 1952, uh, which is probably the first modern building of Bangladesh. So it's the Fine Art Institute, which is in Dhaka. And in a way, this building kind of uh, created the tropical modernity uh, that actually gave us a certain kind of a benchmark from we, where we started in terms of architecture. So it's also very, again, pavilion-like space uh, allows this uh, overall atmospheric issues that we generally try to deal with. This is one of my projects in the very early times in the late 90s, uh, where uh, in, a, in this project we tried to open the edges. We call this a pavilion apartment where everything is more or less open. Um, you can close it off if you like, during, especially during the rain or monsoon or even during winter. But otherwise, in a nice sunny day, you can open it up and the space just breathes on its own. And these are some of the photographs of that. And we also had incorporated a courtyard. And courtyard is also something quite unique because courts are almost like a soul of a household. And the reason for that is I grew up in a house where we had this beautiful courtyard around which we've always, you know, sort of spent a lot of time together with the family. So what the court does is it, it actually helps uh, generating the airflow. How it does, and especially if I show you in this image, you can see that hot air generally rises up. So if you have a high volume, the airflow goes up and there's a vacuum and then the air comes from the sides to, to, to actually create this draft of air. And this really works very well. And quite often, like this project that I'm showing you is in this building, which we designed a long time ago. And I'm um, sorry. So basically, that's the courtyard volume. So the air basically flows up, and openings from the sides just tries to fill in. So it creates this draft of air, which really helps to keep the space ventilated. The court from the top. And in this project, we never really had to use any kind of artificial means, no air conditioning, not even a fan. So it just worked on its own. So that, this was quite an important experience for me in terms of design, designing with passive means of climate control because uh, later on in many other projects, we employed the similar kind of an idea. Like this is a project which was as a small house in the uh, northern part of Dhaka, where it's a very basic nine square grid plan. And if you, oops, I'm always pushing the wrong button. So that's the court in the middle. And then we have courts on the corners. And these are the main spaces, living spaces. What it does is these corner courts actually creates this airflow, which then brings out through that space um, that this is the building made in brick, and these are actually the corner courtyards, and that's the main shaft which actually takes the air out. So these are some of the projects where I've tried this um, way of working with ventilation and light naturally. And you know, if you go to the upper level, it's more like pavilion-like spaces. You just sit around enjoying the nature and its own. Uh, another project, which was a competition, we won the competition, but we didn't get to build it, but uh, it's a similar technique where we employed. So the site was here, which is the French-German embassy, and we won the competition. The, so the French and the German decided to create, make an embassy together, which they already have built in Dhaka. And here you see... Uh, this is the American embassy, that's the Canadian embassy. So this is all embassy zone. 
And so this is Thai and this is Chinese. So this in the middle was the land for the French and the Germans to make an embassy together. And so as in terms of security, we had a brief where they talked about that you need to have 25 meters setbacks from all sides. So initially, when we thought that we might be able to give them two different buildings, it was not a possibility because uh, it had to be one single building and the, both the ambassadors would be on the same floor. So there are all these briefs that came about. So basically, 25 meters setback from all sides gives you a very small footprint. And we just stacked the floors. What happens is then you, there is a visibility from outside, which the clients did not want, that they do not want people to see what's happening within the embassy. So, you know, these, all these different things uh, in terms of challenges of the project uh, gave us sort of an idea where we uh, placed more or less the entrance, this is the passport and the visa section, there are certain things on the edges. So keeping those 25 meters setback from all sides and placing the building in the middle. So again, if you look at this little image, maybe if I can show you in a plan. Um, so you have this court in the middle, which is like an atrium, and, and that is, and then we have corners cut in a way that it creates that ventilation again. So even though an embassy would function as a um, air conditioned building, but even then, we always keep that in mind that the building should be able to function on its own, that it should be able to function without having any artificial means. It's, for me, buildings are always like a being. I treat it as, as, a, as not a human, but let's say a being which is, which is by itself able to function. And it should not be like a machine that we generally try to see. It's not a machine, so that's why um, I try to create these central spaces and edges and corners through which it creates this uh, ventilation. So this is the section of the building. You can see the central atrium, and then the offices are all on the sides. And, and this is what we uh, designed, basically, to have the corners open and to have it more like a con concrete structure uh, we won first prize for this project, but uh, later on uh, it was given to a French architect, and, you know, happens. <laughs> so, yeah, so now it's built. I, I don't want to show you the building, but it's not good. <laughs> um, so the material that we work with is brick. Why? Because it's a delta. It's a delta, and we don't have anything but earth. We don't have stone, we only have earth. So from, let's say, second century, third century BC, this is a Buddhist monastery. And from that time on, all people did is just create, make, you know, bake bricks, and bricks have been our material. And so this is the most easily available, the cheapest material you can still get. And you know, we, if you go to Bangladesh, you'll see these beautiful terracotta temples, um, intricately detailed, all done with earth and nothing else but earth. So there is magic you can create out of earth. And um, we have these masons who are really unique, like especially this guy here. He is our mason for the uh, mosque project. And he's one of the Aga Khan Award winners because Aga Khan Award actually uh, recognizes the project, not the architect. So if I'm a winner, he's a winner as well. So it's, a, it's the entire project where w all the different uh, people who are involved and engaged in the project actually got the award. So he's a winner. Um, and he did, uh, all these people, they come from the northern part of Bangladesh and they are really unique and, and they can really make magic out of earth and brick. So these are some of those examples. So as I mentioned, brick is our material. One project which is um, about brick kiln. So it, at one point there was this talk in the government level that we are emitting too much of carbon by burning coal. Uh, because we are making bricks so much and there is such a necessity. 
So there was a new technique that came about, which is the hybrid Hoffman brick kiln, where they do not emit as much uh, carbon into the atmosphere. So these are like carbon trading projects. So one such project where this is one of those kilns where they um, add a, a certain amount of coal into the brick so it really does not emit too much of um, carbon into the uh, atmosphere. So one project which we did uh, was a small sort of a, a house in a way, a kind of a, uh, I would say a studio sort of a space, which was right next to the kiln, uh, designed to keep the engineers who actually work in that uh, brick kiln, to just have them uh, stay there in the night. And the client's idea was just that, let's make it absolutely next to the kiln so that people can see that it does not really uh, breathe uh, or it does not emit uh, as much of carbon dioxide into the air as it does. So this was our idea. So taking that idea from the brick kiln, um, at the same construction technique, uh, just um, basically having a small uh, sleeping area and a living area and a small court and opening it up as much as possible. Um, so that was the interior of it, but it just did not get to build, but I really love this project. If anybody knows anyone who wants to build it, <laughs> I would love to do that. So um, talking about architecture, another thing which is very important in our, uh, the way we practice or we construct is um, there's a lot of handcrafting that goes on. Everything we build is handcrafted. So if it is a 20-story building or a two-story building. Everything is handmade. So that is an important aspect. And quite often, in, uh, what I see among my colleagues is that they want, they're making hand -built, handmade projects, but trying to finish it like as if it was machine-made. So you know, that's where I try to you know, take my position that if it is handmade, there will be imperfection. And if there is imperfection, we should be able to celebrate it. So that's why um, a lot of projects are about handcrafting and bringing these skills or handcraftedness uh, and to celebrate them. So this is, again, another... And, and these people who we work with, like the brick mason or even this guy, uh, Esharul, they have been working with us for, like, 10, 20 years, they're like family. They're like, you know, people who are so close to you that you just keep on continuing working with them and they understand you like anything. So you don't need drawings actually, all you just need is to communicate with them. So this project here especially, we just used um, all the images that you see here are all recycled stone pieces, which we found from some place. Uh, stone is very expensive in Bangladesh. You cannot just build with it because it's highly taxed and only a very high-end project would be able to afford uh, using stone. And this is travertine, which is even more expensive. But we found this uh, from a construction site, uh, small pieces, bits and pieces, and we just took them at a very low price and we just gave it to him and he actually created magic out of that. So. I think that's the ability of handcrafting, which you would never get uh, when you're building something with, uh, let's say, uh, machine-finished products or industrial products. So we try to celebrate that. Uh, this is also something quite unique. You find that uh, quite a lot, porcelain mosaic, and we created the bathtub with that. Rickshaw painting is something also quite a unique form of art which we have tried to use in some of our projects, like using not tiles, but making paintings in the bathrooms with that. And it's a very psychedelic, surreal way of uh, seeing <laughs> uh, things. So we thought this would be a nice idea. So as I was mentioning that we rarely do drawings when you do the site, you just go and explain it to them. You just talk to them makes small samples and that's how we produce. So big drawings, formal drawings, at times doesn't make much of a sense. So this is Dhaka and um, it is 
20 million people, one of the fastest growing cities in the world, 300 square kilometer in area. And it's a city which was right next to the river Buriganga. Um, you know, it, it started from, let's say, the Mughal times. But in the last 20 or 30 decades, uh, two, three decades, or 20 to 30 years, it has really grown in an unprecedented rate. And that probably because it is placed absolutely in the center of the country. And from here, anywhere you go, it's about 300 kilometers of distance. So that's why it's, uh, it's there. Um, and um, we have all different kind of disparity in the city uh, where there is informal settlement and formal way of living both side by side. And so basically that's our, that's what you have. It's a challenge. It's a, um, in this density I don't think you, until you go there, wouldn't be able to experience, but that's something of a challenge. And quite often when we build something, this is the section we build. We don't have the luxury of making two-story small houses. I don't think I've built any except for the one that I showed you. You don't get to build that. All we do is apartment buildings. And this is the section you build. So just stacks of floors trying to, you know, com compactly put people together. So one such project, which is right on uh, a major spine of the city, which is this one, and the site is right here, uh, right here, that's my site. And this is a developer project. Quite often I try to avoid working for developers because they don't really let you um, do architecture. The developer projects for me from the very beginning was a sort of a project where architecture is being commodified or it's a product and I have not been able to um, come to terms with this idea of architecture becoming a product. Um, so it has always been to me uh, something to do with poetics and rationality and a balance of both, but I never see commerce in it. So that's the, that's the problem I have had. And that's why my projects are all about fringes and public and you know community which you know, th I think is a wonderful way of seeing architecture because these are the architecture that never comes into focus. So this is one project which is actually a developer project. The reason I built it or accepted this commission was the landowner of this place came to me and wanted me to design it, that's one. Secondly, at that time we were going through a change in the bylaws and we had much more rules change with the setback and everything. So. A very common developer project would have apartments on two sides. We have the central core where you have elevators and stairs, one fire, two stairs, which are two both fire stairs because it's a, a building which is more than 33 meters. So these are just two apartments. But what we tried to do is, as I mentioned, that there is this is right next to a spine of the city and the road remains quite busy. Uh, we tried to open this up, which is for the reason of ventilation, as I mentioned, that you need to keep your buildings very porous. So it has this porosity, it allows the cross flow of ventilation, but at the same time it creates a kind of a facade which is for the city, and it's not only for the people who are living in the building. So it's a, it's a building which is occupied by 20 families, and they do have their... Uh, fair share of views on both sides, but the roadside, we wanted it to become a facade which is for the city. So I think in a very small way, we try to contribute that uh, through architecture in some ways. And this is again another project which is that these stacks of floors where the client wanted us to bring back this idea of long veranda, which I showed you as an image. So this is what we did. We've incorporated these long verandas on the edges while keeping the spaces in between and, and pushing a few courts in the middle. So if you look at it, uh, that's the long veranda which is sort of going around the building and you have the different functions in the middle. Uh, different floors with different functions. 
And that's the building, uh, what it looks like, because of these verandas that we have on the edges. And because of the different functionality, this is also a residential project. So we have um, apartments on each floor. And in the lower floors, we have some public functions. This is a project which has now gone into um, approval process. So at the end, when it finishes, hopefully we will have some greens and then it might look a bit more uh, interesting and livable. And these are some of other projects. I'm just showing you the, all the different aspects that we have been trying out to make a building function. So these are like, it, it was a large building, but we tried to open up the middles so that you have light and airflow both together. So um, I'll go to the project which is which was, for me, in the very beginning of my career, a very important project, which is the Liberation War Museum and the Independence Monument. So which uh, was a competition, and we won the competition in 1997. And in 1998, the project started. I was about 27 years old at that time. So um, for a young architect, uh, that was a big commission. Not just a big commission, it was a big responsibility to design a, a monument which is to the independence of your country is something really interesting and a, you know, very difficult a task. Uh, if you look at the city here, that's Dhaka, and you can see the density and, and how built it is. So there are only very few green areas that are left. And the site we were given for the museum was right here, and it is one of the rare green parks that are left in the city. So that was one of the challenges, like how do you build a museum in a park and uh, where the city is already quite built up. But it, the site made sense in terms of history because you know this was a ground during the British time. Uh, it was a horse racing ground. And in the seventh, uh, 1971, the uh, our father of the nation, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, gave this speech, which actually was about becoming a free sovereign nation. And that's where also, again, after nine months of war, um, uh, that this is where the Pakistan army actually surrendered. So the site has a lot of history. So that made sense. But then again, how do you then design a museum in a park? So what we tried to do is we tried to have uh, the minimum of footprint that is necessary to create this. We just take, took that space and left the entire space more or less free for to be used as a park. So that's what you see. Um, that's the museum. And uh, so what we've created is actually a plaza. And you just enter and you walk through, you go up. And there is a reflecting pool around it, and there is a uh, elliptical walkway which is surrounding it. So uh, we conceived the entire thing like a journey. So you walk up. It's a very horizontal space, so it has basically five feet of height, so that it does not obstruct your view. So it's basically just a plaza that you see. Yes, the scale is kind of monumental because it is for the country. Um, so when you come to the plaza, first you encounter a small monument, which is to that speech of 7th March, which triggered the war. In the central space, there is a water feature, which is like a circular water, which has a central little hole through which the water is drawing inside. And at the end, you have the tower, or the independence monument. And, um, and we took the museum below grade. So the museum is actually under the plaza. So that's the section. And if you want to go to the museum, that's the wall that takes you down. So the idea was that freedom, dream, aspiration, these have a preferred direction. They go upwards. Anything that relates to infinite generally takes that upward lip. And memory, sadness, always urges the subterranean. You know, it's sadness, which is you want to embed it into your heart and in your soul. So that's why it's inside the earth. And whereas the celebration part, which is about the future of a nation, which is all on the top. 
So that's how we sort of try to bring these two duality together. So this is how it looks like. Though we won the competition in 1997, the project finished in 2013. So it took us like 16 years to finish this project because it's a politically motivated project. Um, you know, when the government changed, there was no interest in the other government. And so we had to wait till again there was, the project was initiated. So, so it took a while to finish. So I grew older. <laughs> <laughs> so um, if you go down, that's how you, uh, this is the ramp that takes you down. First is an audiovisual room, then you go down again. These are the museum spaces. This is the central space that I showed you, the water on top. And then that's again, and then you basically come out. It's a very basic and simple design. And if you go down, it's, since it's below grade, we try to bring in as much light as possible. And this space, I mean, the displays are printed on glass, just elements and uh, events of war, which are just, you can just walk through those spaces. And, um, and then you come to this dark space, which is sort of a, we call it the ex black or the dark exhibit area where you have images of genocide and killing which is, you know, one of the dark side of any war. And then you enter into that central chamber, and that central chamber has this water column, which has the light source or the oculus uh, on the top, through which the daylight comes in. So it's a column of water, in a way, symbolizing the sadness. And there is no exhibit in that wall. It's just a very contemplative space. So you just go there, spend some time remembering the people who has lost their lives and the struggle of the war. And so that's basically that space. Then you come out and then you move to the upper level. I think there's a small video, if we can, hopefully, yeah. So. It basically shows the spaces. So the Tower of Light, I just describe it quickly. It is, um, it is uh, made out of glass, but glass was not the material. The material was actually light. So we just stacked glass one top of another. So you see here, these are just stacks of glass created into panels, and then the panel was uh, uh, cladded onto the space frame structure. Uh, so what it does is during daytime, if there's light on the tower, it basically refracts the light and creates this very prismatic kind of an effect. And um, during the evening, it, it sort of is lit from the outside to create this um, tower of light, which is, to us, was the sort of a beacon of hope for a young nation. Um, and during the 16th December on our victory day, it's just packed with people celebrating and enjoying uh, the birth of a country. So um, I'll, how am I going with time? <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. So I'll, I'll show you the mosque project, which actually brought me uh, this Aga Khan Award and all, all kind of traveling back and forth. <laughs> I've hardly had enough time to sit in my office to work, but hopefully this would be my last, right? <laughs> Now I need to go back and start working. So the site is right there, the blue dot, uh, which is absolutely to the northern end of the city of Dhaka. And um, Dhaka, as you can see, is all surrounded by water on all sides. So it's basically densely built in the middle. And the project itself was actually commissioned to me by my grandmother. So my grandmother, one fine day, you know, very formally invited me for a cup of tea. I went to her, and she was sitting with her 
map of the land she owns in the northern part of the country, or Dhaka, and she said that she wanted to donate a piece of land to build a mosque, and she wanted me to design it and build it. So that's how the commission came to me. That's my grandmother. Uh, and this is basically uh, very f early in 2006 when we had this prayer right under a jackfruit tree with all the community surrounding, asking them to come and basically telling them that this land is being donated and we will have a mosque on it. So that's how the beginning of the entire project. And my grandmother, uh, this was September, she was still there, and then in December she passed away. So then it became sort of a promise that I you know, made to her and I had to finish this project. Um, so if you see the land basically from 2004 to 2015 or 16 even now, it's a place which is constantly going through transformation. It used to be an agriculture land and then slowly started building up and it's now very much a settlement which is really not planned. So it's an unplanned settlement. It was not within the city area or the uh, municipality uh, till then. So there was no facilities being provided. So that was one of the major concerns that it's a place in transformation. So these are the points which are uh, important because these are the things I had to sort of uh, took as challenge. Um, going back to the very beginning and questioning what is a mosque, especially in 2004, 2005, right after the 9-11, there was a lot of two wars going on. Muslims were being questioned. So, you know, so those are the things. And even in, in the context of Bangladesh, we were also having a lot of, you know, concern in terms of radical Islam and all that. So that was a point where I thought what would be the right thing to address uh, when you're building a mosque. So questioning that very question, what is a mosque? And then searching for a connection with the Bengal legacy. Uh, addressing the location, as I was mentioning, it's going through a transformation, spirituality as the main element engagement with the community to create a sense of ownership and keeping the basic elements of architecture bare and minimum. So these are the basic points I had in mind. And so the first question, what is a mosque? Or how it came into being, let's say. So during the Prophet's time, if you look at this image here, basically the mosque actually came from, or the gene of mosque lies in the house form of the Arabian Peninsula. So basically it's the house form which was then elongated and created into a space which can hold a congregation of people. So all you really need is for a congregational prayer, a large space and the right direction towards Mecca. And that's basically it. You don't need anything more than that. So um, all the other things that has come about, let's say, was later on as Islam moved from, uh, let's say, from the Arabian Peninsula to the east, west, north, south. Uh, it adapted to the local culture, the local construction method, local techniques. So it changed its shape, its form, its uh, different uh, ways of expression. So a mosque, let's say, in Turkey, an Ottoman Empire, which finally you know, became one of the symbols of mosque architecture where we take dome and minarets from is sort of that. In Cordoba, this is one of the finest mosques I've ever visited. So um, uh, this is the Grand Mosque, which is a beautiful space. Uh, again, it's a very different thing. And then mosques in Mali, in Tunisia, in the Indian subcontinent, let's say the Mughal Mosque, or even in China. Nothing are similar, actually. So there hasn't been any prescription as such in terms of mosque. And if you look at Bangladesh, uh, we have uh, uh, Islam came into Bengal in the uh, 19th, uh, 15th century, let's say. So 15th, 16th century, and during the Sultanate period, this is the most authentic mosque form that you find. So these are some of the researches we did. And this is the mosque that has become of Bangladesh now. Stacks of floors. There is no quality of space, no architecture. The typology has completely lost its meaning. And this is what has happened to the symbols. So um, to question, do you really need these symbols? Or how necessary is it? 
So we basically tried to look into the spiritual aspect of uh, the religion or the religious values and you know, try to do, uh, address it in a different way. So that's the site here. And if you see, that's the square site we were, I was given, 75 feet by 75 feet. But uh, the site and the Qibla created a certain uh, angle, which is nine, about 13 degrees. So I had to create those shifts, which initially was some sort of a square within a square, uh, this being the prayer hall. Later on, I added a circle in it uh, to accentuate that uh, shift of that axis. And then, of course, looking into all the different ways of architecture and then finally coming up with my own uh, conceptual drawing where you have the central prayer hall and the ancillaries are on the sides and these are the corners which remain open uh, to sky. So that's the prayer hall in the model and that's the corner courts which are absolutely open to the sky f to facilitate ventilation which I've constantly talked about. And um, so the central prayer hall is absolutely column free, uh, large span, about 50 feet by 50 feet. And uh, the edges are, it's like um, wrapped around by a brickwork. And we tried to have no columns within the brickwork because columns actually cost money. So we tried to keep it load bearing to reduce the cost of construction. As I mentioned that it was uh, donated by my grandmother, the land. And she did give a small sum of money to initiate the project with which we actually built the foundation. But the entire project was actually funded by the locals, funded by many different people from whom I could get some money. <laughs> so, um, so it was every single uh, money had to be really used very responsibly. So that's why um, it is sort of a bare and minimum building. So this is where you enter, that's a colonnade. And you do not enter directly because we wanted to create these bends so that you can actually, you're, you're being conditioned towards praying or that feeling of spirituality as you take these bends. So this was intentional. Sketches, drawings, so sections and elevations. And porosity, as I mentioned, which is very important in our climate. So this is what the mosque actually looks like in its surrounding. You can see all the construction going on. In fact, there are new buildings which has come up now, and it's growing very fast. So at one point, you will not be able to see the building anymore. So it won't be there. So facades do not make much of a sense. So basically, it was about looking within than looking without. And that's why all these corner courts and openings are so important what you see here, that openings, because that is what brings you the light and the ventilation. And it's a very lower middle income neighborhood. Uh, so, you know, the, the, the funding we got was not that amount. It was like $150,000 altogether. So with that money, we had to build the entire project. So light is a major element in this project. Uh, this is the ornament. This is also what creates the spirituality of that space. And this is also something uh, which gives its grandeur in a way because the materials are so basic and simple and bare. So um, that's a time-lapse image. You can see how the light changes throughout the day. And no two days are similar as, you know, the, the entire, throughout the year, uh, the sun, the movement of the sun and everything, uh, the entire ex experience in the atmosphere changes quite, uh, quite a lot. So, so it's quite unique to go and see that. Okay, so uh, this was after the Aga Khan Award when uh, we had a um, lunch organized for the locals. So everybody came together in the prayer space. First we had a prayer and then later on people just used that space like a, 
like a place where, so I don't mind having these kind of gatherings because mosque uh, from the very beginning has been more than just a prayer space. It's a place where people can gather for social activities. So this is one such event. And we also had exhibitions done. So it's a space which in a city like Dhaka where there is such a density and people do not have places to go to, this could be a place which is like a refuge, a place where some, somebody can come and just spend some time, even though they're not intending to pray. So that's how we would like to see this building. Do I have time or not? Because there's one, one project, if not, then I can finish it here. Should I or not? <laughs> if you're not in a hurry to go home, I could just maybe very quickly share one project. And this is, I must tell you, out of Dhaka. So all the ugly you know, views that I showed you, this would be really something unique. So this is a project which is in the southern part of Bangladesh. And south of Bangladesh is quite beautiful. You can see that's the Bay of Bengal. And um, these are all the rivers that are coming down. And this dark area that you see is actually uh, the mangrove, the largest mangrove forest in the world, actually. It's called the Shundurban. And in the Shundurban is the place where Royal Bengal tigers are living. So that's their home. Um, so that's a very unique uh, place, which is definitely at the moment under a lot of uh, threat because of the climate change and the water, you know, sea level rising. Um, so that's one thing. But um, my project is actually somewhere around here, which is a resort, uh, a very high-end boutique resort that the client came to me and wanted me to design. The brief talked about very socially, environmentally responsible project. And they also wanted to give people the authentic experience of being in a delta. So in a way, a village atmosphere and celebrating that and celebrating the life, uh, how people live in these areas. So that's actually the site right here. So we have a river, which is Kopotakko, going this way. And there's another small, very uh, thin river, which is uh, Bhoirab. So these two rivers make up the site here. And around the site, it's all agriculture land. So this area is very fertile, and almost the entire Bangladesh is being fed by these, uh, you know, whatever we are growing here. So it's about three crops a year. And um, these are all villages surrounding our site. So there are some village here, on, but not on our, on our site. We did not have any village, but it's all on the fringes that you see. And... Um, so that's the site right here. That's our site, and that's the river that's going. So it's a beautiful place. And from the site, this is the view you get. And um, farmland all around, so paddy fields. And in the wintertime, you see these mustard fields and date palm tree. So it's a unique landscape, actually. Once you get out of Dhaka, it's a beautiful country. And. Uh, and the agriculture system is still very primitive, so cow carts are a common thing. In fact, in the morning, there's a traffic jam of cow carts. <laughs> so that's quite interesting to see. So, you know, a, an architect like me who was trained, yeah, or let's say, first of all, born and brought up in a city like Dhaka, and then studied in the city, grew up there, uh, in fact, my architecture education is a very formal, hardcore, modernist education. All my projects probably shows that. Um, so, um, you know, how do I address a project like this in a pristine, very virgin kind of a landscape? So that became quite a challenge. And in a way, uh, the idea then was, well, I, I really struggled with this. Like, how do I approach this project? It was quite a struggle from the very beginning. So what we did is, uh, you know, this is what I wrote in the very beginning of my visit, that rural Bangladesh is uniquely beautiful, the soul of the Delta land. It feels like a crime to invade this silence with the roaring noise of architecture. So I just didn't want architecture, let's say, architecture with a big A to be there. It just did not feel like a right thing to do. So we kind of tried to look into the wisdom of the land and crafting of hundreds of years, how these lands have been created, and the, and the dynamics that really exists in the land. 
So if you look very closely into Bangladesh, this is what you see. There are lots of numerous ponds. The reason for these ponds is people dig them. And when you dig a pond, you take the earth, you create a mound, and on the mound you place your houses. So basically, there's a, it's a very flat land, that's why this creates a sort of an undulation into the landscape, which then uh, lets people have a better ground and, or a higher ground to create uh, their own homesteads. So these are the homesteads that you see, small houses, and then the big ponds, which actually holds the water for them. And so we did an extensive study of the villages which are surrounding the site. So we had a few interns coming in, summer interns from Cornell University who went and did an extensive study. So if you look into a household, these are the elements that you find. So there are rooms where people live, so that those are living quarters, toilets, uh, storages, and then chicken coops and cow sheds and all kinds of things. And these are generally placed around the courtyard. So these are like small courtyards and all these different elements are just placed or clustered around courtyards. That's how people live. And these courtyards are then again connected with each other, uh, sort of giving a very communal space, nothing distinctly defined, but just leaking from one to the other. And that's how the entire villages are being created. So the villages are, you know, just a clustering of courtyards. And so this is one of those villages. This is another kind. So the interesting thing is this village, which is a potter's village, the courtyards are much more squarish in shape because that's where they dry their uh, products. And whereas this one is more like a weaver's village where the uh, where, where they work with bamboo. So the courtyards are much more linear in shape because of the shape of the bamboo with which they work with. So those are also kind of interesting things to find out. Then we also looked into the things that we have actually lost, which are not there anymore. And one such thing is actually this roof form, which is the Bangla roof. And the, the word Banglo actually comes from the word Bangla. So this is the Bangla roof which is, you don't see it anymore, and which was also taken by the Mughals, and we also have some of these interpreted into um, our temples. So this is not there anymore. So that's what, something we thought could be a point of revival. And this is an image to any, if you ask any Bangladeshi child to draw a village, this is the image that they will draw. We've all drawn it. <laughs> so. So it's a kind of an idyllic image uh, in a child's mind of a village. So that was also something unique. All the different materials and textures that you find. So these are the ingredients with which we started our design. And that's actually the two rivers. We thought of bringing the guests at the bridge right here and then giving them an experience of coming by boat because the road we have is coming down right here. So this is for more the uh, services that required by the resort, but people would come by boat, so they get a nice authentic experience of being there. And my plan, or master plan, which initially was looking like this, after the study of the villages and everything, we sort of kind of disintegrated and became something like this. So these are the different huts. So what we did is we've created this huts which are made out of earth. So these are, our material is earth or mud. So we used mud brick and we've used, th used thatch roof uh, to have these buildings built. And they are all like clustered and creating small courts of their own. So this is one, of, one such building where we have, this is the thickness of the wall which is about 30 feet, uh, 30 inches or two feet, six inches. We are still on inches and feet. I don't know what you're, okay. <laughs> so yeah, basically uh, 30 inches thick walls, really beautiful mud wall. Um, and it keeps the space uh, during the summer months really cool and in, during the winter months much more warmer. And the other thing which we have done in the project I think is very unique is including the villagers in the construction process. So the so he is a young man from, let's say, the potter's village, Shumon. He's working with us. 
So he and of his generation, they've all studied in village schools and once they finish their studies, they want to go off to the city of Dhaka, getting a job, you know, looking for something and staying in one of those um, informal tin shades that I showed you. So that's how they basically start life with a very struggling uh, situation. So we said, why don't you stay in the village and work for this resort? And you know, don't need to go. And so basically, they became a major force in the entire project, so he and his generation. Uh, this is their landscape, this is their household. So it's a potter's village, you can see. And that's his grandfather. Um, he knows pottery, so he knows how to make it. But this boy, he has no knowledge of pottery because this entire uh, skill was never handed down to him because it doesn't make enough money. So he, his parents thought if he study and, you know, maybe he would get a better job and probably he will earn more. So then we sort of, this, there is this lack of pride in what they do. So in a way, we try to create that connection uh, between him and his grandfather by creating interesting products that we came up with and then which we can actually use in the uh, resort project. So that's how we sort of created a connection between him and him. Um, so there are some workshops that we do. So this is our construction process. We have sun-dried bricks, which we buy from local uh, brick kilns before they put it into uh, the kiln. So this is the bricks we use. We use mud mortar. And so mud mortar and brick creates that construction. We have wooden frame. And the, you know, basically the villagers come and build it. So we have the planning, we, have, we made the foundation and then the villagers come and build the entire thing with us. And that's the thatching. You don't find this kind of thatching anymore. So these people are almost rare. We have like two teams in the southern part of Bangladesh where we could source them and ask them to come and start building. So this is like weaving the entire uh, palm leaves. So that's the project, actually. Women are also included, and they do the plastering, and the plasters are really beautiful. Women do the best plaster, actually. And so these are our female workers on the site. And the, these, are, these are the huts, actually. So if you go there, you'll be able to live in one of these huts. And so this is our elevation, our riverfront elevation of the project. And you hardly see the buildings, actually. It's just... Um, huts, and uh, initially I was very scared because I thought people would, I'd probably lose my license <laughs> by building this project. But, you know, I thought at that point, in that location, this was the answer or the right answer for that site. So I just went ahead and did it, what, what I thought was right. This is during the winter season or the dry season when the water goes down. And that same place when the water comes up is more or less now more flooded. So the entire landscape sort of changes. So we didn't try to make it artificial. We just left it the way it should be. This is our organic gardens. So we have these organic gardens during the dry season. This is pretty much images from the dry time. And these are things that are pottery, and especially from the potter's village, they do. And the other thing, which is, I think, the most unique part of this project is once the buildings are done and we've you know, created these houses with the villagers, how does it benefit the villagers? So that's when I, we created this Panigram Community Initiative where we actually um, have done these craft diversification workshops, We've done, made these savings groups. So we have these community architects, like this girl and her. They're all architects, but they work for communities. So they are called POCA, they call themselves. So basically I brought them in and I asked them to create this, uh, uh, sort of a, com to connect with the villagers and to give them certain ideas about what to do. So, um, so we have these savings groups where 20 to 25 women 
every day or every week saves one dollar each. So that makes $25 a week. And by, let's say, within this last two years, they now have a substantial amount of money to themselves, actually. They don't give it to anywhere, anybody. They keep it to themselves in a bank account in their own name. And the resort also put in a similar amount of money so with which we have created a seed bank. And from that seed bank, they loan themselves a certain amount of money. So you see, we in Bangladesh, of course, microcredit has been a major force in, uh, in creating housing, but that was in the late 70s, late 80s, let's say. Um, th that kind of microcredit doesn't work anymore these days. Nowadays, it's much more about empowering people with their own resources, keeping it to themselves. So that's how I th we found that this really works well. And so that's what we've been trying to do with these projects. There are f few of these kind of projects in Chinaida and many other places where they have built like 40, 50 houses based on this same technique. So this is one of the projects in Chinaida where you have $1,500 houses where you have two bedrooms and a bathroom. And the process, the way it goes, they start with mapping so the community gets together, they create map of their own places, own areas, so that they know exactly their uh, site and their space, uh, look, uh, what they own. And then they make these aspirational models where they talk about their own aspiration to the architects. And then the architect and the client, basically, they sit together and then come to a solution which would be uh, you know, possible within this $1,500, uh, the best possible use of that money to create a certain sense of space and place and a house. So this is one such project, which is, again, what you can see here. So my, uh, I did a studio at Harvard GSD. So f for my Harvard GSD master's students, this was my project, uh, designed $2,000 homes. And it was not easy. <laughs> I mean, so what is $2,000 to a villager in Bangladesh? 3000 a goat. And that's a lot, actually. That's a lot of money. And for that reason, uh, you know, we took them to the site. All my students traveled to Bangladesh. We've given them uh, real clients because the communities handpicked five clients whose house that will be built. So the students went and talked to these clients. One of them is this Nimaipal. He's a potter, and he doesn't have a proper house to live. This is where he lives, actually. And it's a, it's a very young family. Uh, this is Usharani. She lost her son, who is a bamboo weaver. So this is the two ladies and the young children. So they are also in need of a house. So they're all willing to take this $2,000 loan from their own savings and have the houses built. So my students went to the site, they saw these Chinaida projects, visited those, and um, understood what is possible. They've also tried out the different materials with hands-on workshops uh, to understand the materials that are available on site. And they talked to the clients. This is Kina Dash. He has lost one of his legs, so he cannot work anymore. So he sat with, the students sat with him. They made models, and then finally, to come up with a design idea. Uh, that's Usharani's family and the students sitting with them uh, to think about this 2000. And it's not just coming up with the design. They had to give a complete calculation how they have used this $2,000. So which, once they designed it, it went back to my office in Dhaka. Uh, one engineer and one an architect basically sat through the entire construction uh, budget and worked out whether it works or not. So it was not that simple. <laughs> so, yeah. So and once we finished the studio, we had an exhibition in the village. You can see that we printed out all the different things, and we just had an exhibition there. Some of the student works where they tried to employ pottery uh, to create these ventilations, and some of these projects have been, you know, so. We had 13 students doing 13 projects, so we took them to the villagers, and the villagers actually from those uh, handpicked five projects which now will be built on site. So that's also something interesting. This, is, this would be my last 
uh, not really a project, but just an idea of what we did. We took this idea and we took it to Venice uh, in the last Biennale where we were invited by the curators to, um, to be a part of the curatorial show. So we were in the Arsenale in Venice. So that's our site. And we basically tried to create this idea of wisdom of the land. So bringing in all the different things and now that we are flooded by the information technology and this boom of information, what is wisdom and what is knowledge and what is information? That's what we tried to kind of focus on. And for me, wisdom is this actually, a mud oven and a pressure cooker on a mud oven. That's how you create wisdom where you are off time, but at the same time, you're not away from your own uh, connection to the place. So that's where uh, our site, and these are all the different elements that you see in the drawing, are all sourced from the villages. So this lady, she gave one of our granaries, this is like seven feet high granary, and she makes it her herself during the dry season. So this is a granary we took to, this, uh, to Venice, and all these different things that you see are made by people with their own hands. And, they, and it's, it's still used. These things are like utensils still being used. That's a grinder, um, essentially a grinder, daybed. So all these different elements we took together and we created the house, houses with steel so just basically giving it a sort of a line drawing. So this was in Bangladesh. We built it, took it all to Venice, and we created this uh, courtyard of a Bengali hut. So you can just go and sit there, relax, and get an understanding of what courtyards are like. So all these different elements, which are actually used by people and donated by people, were all brought together to create this installation. And houses are all made out of steel. That's a boat. Uh, so this is just a video of the site. That's surrounding our site, where you see all these things are happening. These are the different villages surrounding the site.
this is what uh, we do as community mapping. So we bring in children and then they basically start learning how you can map your own community. And so they have all their names and whose house is which one. So basically first creating a map and then taking measurements and then putting it on a graph paper so they know how to make their own maps now. So these are the drawings. The drawings that I showed you are all actually made by them. So this is all their own drawings. And this is our savings group where women get together and sit and you know talk about their own needs. Even children do their own savings. And we quite often bring students from Dhaka to sort of create awarenesses about plastic and all these other things. And this is our craft diversification workshop. This is Chandra Shikhosha. He's one of the very, one of the most prominent uh, craft product designers in Bangladesh. So he comes and does all these workshops with uh, the villagers. And some of the products that they're developing now are also being, um, you know, taken for export. So. Thank you so much for listening for so long. Thank you. Thank you very much for this not only inspiring, but deeply humbling talk. Thank you. Thank humbling you. in its thoughtfulness, in its endless dedication to the land and to the people, and in its wealth of solutions to problems that we all share, but that we tend to look for in obvious places. So as we wrap up today, I would like to encourage you all to Wet your curiosity, go out into the world, and look for solutions in unexpected places. They are out there for the taking, and we need to be aware that the rest of the world has a lot to teach us. Thank you very much.